What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Tar Heel Illustrated. Dot com, or of course, if you're watching on our fast growing YouTube channel, that is Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me, as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And AJ, we're here to talk a little Carolina football now that the regular season is officially over. But before we dive into that, I got a couple things to promote. As you guys know, we've been promoting this as well on Twitter and on some of our videos as well. Get free premium membership at Tar Heel Illustrated.com, link in the description below for just 20. 21, um, less than a candy bar a month. I mean, it's a heck of a deal if you think about it. $20, get premium membership for a whole year. I guess I think it breaks down to, I think Brandon did the math. He's better than I am, but around a candy bar. $1.68, $1.68. Hey Doesn't get much. So money. actually, so for the price of what is a normal subscription, you could buy five. So give them away as uh, holiday gifts. Exactly, Christmas exactly. Gifts. It's a great time to do that. That um, deal runs out on Friday. So still time to take advantage of that great time to do it as well. Football, basketball going on, uh, recruiting 365 days a year. So if you want to get involved, want to get access to our premium message boards, access to a lot of our premium articles, you got to be signed up. So do that link in the description below. And also, AJ, this podcast is sponsored by Rogue Apothecary. Really excited to have them sponsoring some of our podcasts, specializing in top shelf, family grown hip products. So CBD, Delta 8, you got tinctures, oils, gummies, whatever you need. Rogue Apothecary is the place for it. I'll put the link for their website in the description below as well. AJ, I think you've used some of them. Have you, have you got it? Yeah, I have. It, those yet? Yeah, and, I, and it, you know, it took a little convincing. My, my wife is a nurse, has been a nurse for 25 years. And uh, she said, yeah, like the oil, like a sleep oil yeah. you take to help you sleep. Uh, you know, as you know, I don't sleep well, especially, <laughs> especially this, this time of year. year. I mean, I had three nights and 11 night stretch in which I didn't sleep because of travel and all that kind of stuff. People don't, it's a lot that goes into this. And, and I've used the sleep oil and it works really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was, I'm not a guy who just dives into anything. I'm not a guy, Hey, I'll try that. What the heck? I'm not that kind of guy, but I talked to uh, Richard who, who owns the company, he and his wife. And about the products and there's a lot of different things people use them for but i used it for that and it worked very very well and i still use it in fact it's up when i when i go to bed it's right in my sink you know brush Ready my teeth and a little bit of oil right there they also have gummies and these other things that are great and yep. they also have things that probably carolina's fan base could use right now because i've never seen the fan base this ticked off before they need to chill a little bit i think uh, some of these products would help them sit back chill a little bit and maybe gain a little bit different perspective Oh, 100 percent. Most definitely. But well, if nothing else, just fall asleep if you want to use it for falling asleep. Exactly. No, 100 percent. Like I said, we'll put the link to their website in the description below. But for all your CBD, Delta 8, you know, family grown hemp products, Rogue Apothecary is the place to be for that. So go ahead and check them out and, and definitely go to their shop and, and buy some of their products. It's fantastic stuff. AJ, enough of the promos, though. Let's dive into some Carolina football. Uh, obviously, Carolina finishing the regular season on Friday night. Tough loss at Carter Finley. Um, unexpected loss with, with how the game kind of looked. You know, Carolina by nine with about a minute and a half left. You know, State ends up scoring, what was it, 13 points in about 30 seconds or so. So completely flipped the game on its head. Carolina ends up losing and finishing six and six in the regular season, fifth in the Coastal Division at three and five, 0 oh and five, winless on the road. Um, a lot to talk about. We hit about it, hit on it in our three things a little bit, which if you haven't seen that video after the NC State game, go check that out after this one's done, of course, um, about kind of how the season went down for the Tar Heels in terms of the expectations that, the, that Carolina came into the year with, top 10 preseason ranking, Sam Howell, you know, being pushed all over the national media by UNC as a program for a Heisman candidacy and as a legit Heisman uh, contender. They also were pushing very heavily. Carolina's preseason ranking where and where they were at. It just seems like there were so many interviews and stuff you kept seeing from national media about the Tar Heels during the offseason. Didn't work out like they maybe expected it to. Like I know I would say 90 to 95 percent of the fan base expected it as well, based on what they were kind of sold for lack of a better word. Um, but yeah, a, a disappointing season for for the fan base. You've kind of alluded on that as well. Disappointing season for the program as well. I mean, I don't get it twisted. I know the players and the coaching staff are you know probably equally as disappointed of the fan base as well with how it went down. But AJ, just before we kind of dive into more specifics on it and kind of Carolina as a program and as a whole and, and what they were able to do, what is kind of your overall takeaway from the season and how it ultimately ended up finishing? Well, let's be fair. We sold it too. 
Yeah, I mean, no doubt. About I, I wrote it. I wrote a column the week of the Virginia Tech game saying that Carolina's way ahead of schedule because at the time it was. Uh, yeah, you, could, you know, you could only judge things in the mo- based on the moment that you're in at that time. Yeah. And everything was heading in the right direction in a big time way. I still think a lot of things in this program are heading in the right direction, but I do think they're at a different point now than they were three and a half months ago, three months ago when they went to Blacksburg. So um, we sold it. I think the program did, you know, they didn't push Sam a lot for the highs, but they did push a lot of his accomplishments and that's fine. That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, didn't, they did not anticipate what was going to happen. I don't, I don't think, I think a lot of people are looking to place blame on you guys were wrong and the program was wrong and all this kind of stuff. You know, you could only do what you're doing in that moment. You, you can't forecast ahead and say, wow, you know, we might be a big bust this year. So let's temper it some in July. No one does that. No one does that in anything in life. You ride the wave and the wave of North Carolina was, was, was almost tsunami like with the way the program was being talked about with the hype Max started saying in late September, maybe even before late September, the hype was ahead of where we really are. It was too much. And he was right. And a lot of us uh, were a part of that because, you know, our job is a liaison between the program and the fan base. Mm -hmm. And we report to the fan base what we learned from the program limited option opportunities to see with our eyes. And even when you see it with your eyes, what did I say the first day of practice was club loaded. Because they look the great. Thing, yeah. uh, they're, they're, they're an all airport team. They're an all walking out, coming out of the tunnel. They look good getting off the bus. bus. Yeah. <laughs> but there were some flaws. Hmm. And I do, we did talk about some of the warning signs that we said early in the year before the year started. You, know, you got, you got some older guys, some leftovers from the Fedora era, guys that are good that they need. Then there's sort of a gap, a cavern, and you got a bunch of young guys you can rely on. And sometimes that, you know, that, that was a bit of a concern. How much can those guys be relied on? I think as it turned out, some of the better players on defense, again, were from the previous regime, right? Came in, came in during the previous regime. So the, things are still building up. I think a lot of people thought some of these young guys were going to be better than they were ready to be. Conley, Grimes, uh, 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 Miles Murphy, all really nice players had great stretches, but they're young. And with youth, you're going to find inconsistency. And sometimes that inconsistency would be on the same series. Yeah. They'd force a third and long. They'd be great the first couple snaps of a drive, and then boom, give up an 18-yard completion, first down. Then there's a penalty next thing you know, the other team's in the end zone. That happened a lot, and they they must obviously get more consistent. Perhaps it means uh, tweaking the scheme some. Maybe it needs a whole. Maybe it means a whole brand new scheme. Maybe it needs to it means to junk all that pre-snap communication, which had them looking like they were like their heads were on a swivel. Jeremiah Gimmel and pre-snap even Friday night against NC State. Still getting guys set, still looking to the sidelines, still barking at dudes. Yeah, game Not as much as earlier in the season, but we're still doing that. And that was on a night that the defense for three quarters played its best football of the year, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So uh, they're, the program is not going to – they're they're not going to try to sugarcoat six and six and three and five in a terrible ACC. The reality, Jacob, is they got trucked by Georgia Tech. And I told you that night before we did our three things, Georgia Tech stinks. Hmm. Georgia Tech had the competitive game with Clemson and they trucked Carolina, so they still stink. I said, they're not any good. Yes, this was just a rotten performance by the Tar Heels in every conceivable way. Georgia Tech won once since then, barely beat a horrible Duke team that went winless in the league. And Georgia Tech was outscored 100 nothing the last two games. The reason that matters is because that loss is on the resume. Yeah. You know, if people will evaluate basketball resumes and think of those things, but they need to understand that in football, you got to consider it too, especially when you're evaluating where a program is. Mm-hmm. They lost at home to Florida State. Who lost at home to an FCS? Who just got beaten by a Florida team that had no reason to play? It been horrible, fired their coach, and Florida State goes there. They get down. They don't win. They don't go to a bowl. So it's two losses to ACC teams that didn't even qualify for a bowl playing an ACC schedule, and the ACC stunk this year. Mm-hmm. Um, on the positive side, the win over Wake Forest was a fantastic win. It was resilient. They showed so much resiliency late in the year. They got a ton out of the open date. Think about what the mindset about this program was going into the open date. They just came off surviving – against Miami and how big was Jeremiah Gemmel hitting uh, Van Dyke's arm causing that interception that I believe Cedric Gray caught. Mm. That was huge. 
that play doesn't get made, there's no postseason. They're not going to a bowl if that play isn't made no. because Miami was going in for the score. That off that week that week off they 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 shook the tree a little bit, and I think they got some clarity. I think some communication improved, and they've been a better team since then. They've been a better team in all phases since then, including on defense. They were they 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 were had Notre Dame had every opportunity to put these guys away, didn't do it. Mm-hmm. Credit Carolina for that. Had the ball in the red zone, minute and a half left, an opportunity to make something crazy happen. The kind of crazy thing we just saw Friday night happen against Carolina. They're down 17 against Wake Forest. They come back and beat them. They score 58 points against a team that went 10-2 and two and, and is in the ACC championship game. Their next game, five days later, the other team in the ACC championship game had a big lead on Carolina, should have put their foot on Carolina's throat, didn't do it. Tar Heels rebounded, sent the game in overtime, should have won in regulation, but still sent the game in overtime. They showed a lot of resiliency there. And then NC State. I... I, I I think I put in our text group that midway through the first quarter, this got Pittsburgh written all over it. Yeah. But can they respond again? And they did. They mm-hmm. dominated the line of scrimmage. The second, third quarter, almost the whole fourth quarter. They ran for almost 300 yards against one of the best defenses in the country. Certainly the best in the ACC. So there are a lot of things to pick at, Jacob. And, and, and we can sit here and do that for a while. I have no problem doing that. Fans certainly are, but there are also some things that tell you, okay, you know, the staff had the kids all the way through. All phases of the staff had the kids all the way through. That doesn't mean they had the right scheme. Doesn't mean they made the right calls. Doesn't mean that there was great communication, but they didn't lose these kids. They kept fighting. All right. And, and I do think that there were elements of the team that got better as the season went on. The run blocking got a lot better. The conventional ground game was very good. Look what they did to state the other night. So a lot of people are focusing on the negatives, and I think that that's okay to do, but you also have to understand that there are some positives. There were some things that improved, and the biggest positive of all, and we can really spend some time on this if you want, is what Mac learned. I think Mac learned a lot, Mm -hmm. and we can go on that here in a minute or so, but um, I think that the value of Mac Brown sitting back, exhaling, pulling out a notepad or however he takes his notes. And he likes to write those notes, those highlighter notes that he does in the pressers, just kind of, okay, here's what I think about this. Here's what I think about that. Hmm, I don't really think I want to do that anymore. Mm, analytics. I don't know about that. Maybe too much on that. My, I, I got to the hall of fame using my gut. So I should use my gut more, that kind of stuff. I think the value and all the things that Mac has learned the last few months and will continue to learn as he continues to reevaluate the season will make them a lot better moving forward. Yeah, most definitely. I think there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of learning that can be taken from this season. It needs to be taken when you look at how Carolina finished. I mean, you have to learn from this season when you consider I mean, there's no doubt about it. I don't care what anybody says. Carolina's roster and talent was better than 6-6, six and six, and especially in the You have to address season. issues. Yeah. So I, I noted some positives, but you have to address the negatives first. Yeah, most definitely. You have to. And, and especially because, like I said, this is a Carolina roster that's more than talented to go better than six and six overall and three and five in the ACC that was just a mess this year. I mean, this is not a good conference for, for the most part. I mean, there's no – there's Carolina, like you're talking about, just looking at some of the scores and games they lost, it's actually pretty interesting to look at. Lost to Virginia Tech to open the season, two straight wins over Georgia State and UVA, and then it's just it's just inconsistency the rest of the season. It's literally loss, win, loss, win, loss, win, loss, win, bouncing back and forth. And I know the second half of the – schedule was a little bit tougher for the Tar Heels. They were in some games down the stretch, you know, looking at Pitt, looking at Notre Dame, um, you know, the Miami game, pulling that one out, even NC State, you know, going up against some good opponents. But ultimately, and beating Wake Forest as well, ultimately Carolina not really able to come on, come out on top of that is what matters the most. I mean, it's one thing to be in a game, but you, you need to win it in, in the long run against some of these better opponents. So inconsistencies kind of barring the Tar Heels all year. Just to dive into some stats real quick before we talk about what Mac learned this year. Carolina finished number three in the ACC in total offense, 36.4, excuse me, points per game. Pretty decent year from the offense, even though I don't think it clicked on all cylinders for, you know, uh, the whole season to say the least. Um, number 11 on defense where a lot of their struggles came, something we've really harped on all year, allowing 31.6 points per game. A couple of things that stood out to me that, surprised me a little bit because I don't associate and I thought Carolina had improved on this coming into this year you don't really like to associate this with what Mac Brown's been preaching about this program dead last in penalties in the ACC 91 penalties 71.9 
yards per game in penalties, just you know, dead last in AC, but as bad as it gets, and dead last in sacks against 244, 245 yards, excuse me, uh, on 45 sacks. So, you know, those are two things that, that kind of stand out in terms of what Carolina really struggled with. You expect Carolina to be more disciplined than that. Even Matt came out and said, I, I think it was after the, I don't think it was after the state game, after the Wofford or after the pit game. I don't know why we have these many penalties. Something he wasn't really able to, able to figure out or correct, obviously, when you look at that and dead last in sacks. I know Carolina run blocking at times, going back to that state game in particular, has been really good, but it has been a team that has struggled, especially early on in the year, something we talk about all the time. It was just blatantly obvious how, how poor Carolina was pass blocking, something they really struggled w- with this year as well. So not a great year for the Tar Heels in some statistical categories on offense. I think Carolina was – and a lot of these offensive categories was actually pretty good. But, you know, looking at defense, even special teams, Carolina struggled with a lot. Didn't really seem to get any better in special teams – after making some off-season changes in that department. Um, if anything, maybe even got a little bit worse in some areas. I think the state game kind of highlighted that with a couple of big plays going on in that game. So I know you wrote about it in your column that you put out um, a couple of days ago, AJ, but just talk to me about what you think kind of Mac has learned and is going to take away from this season in particular. Well, to, the best way to learn when you're trying to improve is to identify weaknesses and why they were weaknesses – I, mean, I think the place to start, it's an easy place to start as a defense, and I'll get to that in a second, but I do want to talk offensive line. that Because early on, Stacey Searles was getting just pummeled by Carolina fans. And, and, and to, be, to be fair and honest, in the media, when we would talk about what's up with Carolina, it began with Stacey Searles for a while in that offensive yeah. line because yeah, they, no they returned all five starters from a year ago, although Brian, Brian Anderson was injured. And Azudu Hatwitsudu was banged up. And four of those guys were three-year starters. Hmm. So what was the problem? Early on, they couldn't protect Sam and they couldn't run block. We talked a lot about the conventional ground game. And I think I pronounced that conversation over about a month ago. And I said, it looks like they fixed that problem. Hmm. And it wasn't just Sam taking off and running. It was if you go look at Ty Chandler's trajectory toward a thousand yards, you'll see it. Go look at what British Brooks did the other day. British Brooks isn't going to get 124 yards just by showing up and playing college football. He needs dudes in front of him opening up lanes for him to run. There's a, there's a reason why British Brooks just finally started playing. And I'm not, it's no slight to him. Hmm. It's just where he was in the pecking order. And use that stuff is, is validated through performance, but the offensive line with the run blocking turned out to be fantastic, but they were terrible with, with pass blocking. And, and, And Dean and I were talking about this last night for a while and something that a lot of people I think this will help them understand a little bit. Stacey Searles was dealing with basically a bunch of three stars on the offensive line. McKeithen was a two-star. Look how big he is and how big he was. And I said two-star. Part of that is because either guys don't go to camps or when they do go to camps, and you've been to these camps before, Jacob. You've been to the Rivals camps. Oh, yeah. Plenty of other camps. You've probably been to more than I have. Mm -hmm. And when the offensive line does drills, they're all pass block oriented. Footwork balance, quickness, all hands, all that kind of stuff. And guys are graded a little bit more heavily on pass blocking because there's camps you really can't gauge a guy with the run block. Mm -hmm. And pass blocking is harder because it requires a little bit better athletes. So a lot of the three-star guys are really good run blockers, but they're maybe just a tad below athletically where the four and five stars are. So they're not going to be as good at pass blocking. At pass blocking, it's not just mono and mono stuff. You've got to be able to gauge, read, react, and be quick and make the play and, and usually get quicker, get leaner guys trying to get around you with whatever techniques they're using or just their raw quickness, right? Mm-hmm. And it, so it requires a different level athlete. And Stacey Searles has been dealing with a three-star offensive line. Now, they're starting to bring in some higher rated guys. Now, obviously, I'm very well aware that just because you're a higher star rating doesn't exactly mean you're going to turn out to be a stud. William Barnes was a four star. He hasn't performed like a four star at North Carolina. He also doesn't appear super athletic yet either. No. And that might be part of the issue because how that affects pass blocking. So I'm curious if they had more of a four star average along the offensive line, a little bit quicker, more athletic guys how much that would affect pass blocking. It's no excuse. The pass blocking was terrible. Yeah, yeah. They got Sam got sacked six times in the opener and five times against NC State. Sam was running for his life. But I've talked to people 
that know a thing or two about a thing or two. And they said a couple of the problems with the pass with the sack issues is related to Sam. Remember last year, Phil Longo was pretty open. And even Sam was talking about how he was responsible for some of the sacks because he held on to the ball too long. And this year I talked to a few people, including some who scout for the next level saying that he, sometimes he would hold the ball and keep the ball in an RPO when he shouldn't. And it would turn into a situation that led into a sack or he would leave too quickly and he'd run into sack. So 45 is a lot. 44 of them were when Sam was on the field. And it's not all, I'm not trying to say it's all Sam's fault, but there's a lot more that goes into it yeah. than just, oh, those guys suck. So yeah, Searles needs more. to be fired. Mm -hmm. The way the line uh, blocked for the run, the conventional run blocking got really, really good as the year went on. And people started uh, not talk as much about Javante and Michael still, mm -hmm. but you know what was a problem? Receivers. Yeah. They still only had one reliable receiver through the course of the year. Antoine Green had a flare-up. Justin Olsen made some plays late. But, man, did they ever need Bo Corrales? Yeah, consistent. Did they ever need another – they needed another guy on the outside that could get open, take the top off, and they didn't have that. I think that was also a factor with the sacks. So the sacks aren't just a byproduct of, oh, the offensive line sucks, fire the coach. There's a lot more that goes into it. And I think all of those factors were at play – with the offensive line. So whatever Mac does with respect to the offensive line, I'm really not going to predict because you don't really know what these things you coaches, college football coaches bounce around, man, three years in one spot and it's ready to go get some new gear somewhere else. And that's just the nature of the beast. So I have no idea what's going to happen there, but if he were to keep Stacy Searles and Stacy Searles were to choose to stay in Chapel Hill, I don't think that that would be the, I don't think that that should upset people as much right now as it would. And, and gauging from what I'm hearing from an onslaught of fans coming from all different directions, like they got their arrows sharpened at him and they've been sharpened since Blackbird. Yeah. So no, no. what did Mac learn? I think Mac will fully evaluate the offensive situation and what is not working. The other thing is the red zone offense. Phil Longo's offense puts up a crap load of numbers. Very impressive. And if you look at this offense as a whole this season, if the defense was average, the offense was good enough to go 10-2. and two. Easy. They would have gone 10 and 2 with an average defense, but they still have issues when they get in the red zone scoring touchdowns. I think they're 74th in red zone touchdown percentage. Mm -hmm. So that's not good. That has to be better. And that's something that they have openly talked about must improve, and it wasn't. And it's not because they just can't push the ball into the end zone. Sometimes I don't even try. I'm still amazed that Friday night, they're up 24 21. They get runs of like, what, 35, 20, and five yards. They get 60 yards and three runs, get down to the 16-yard line. They are owning the line of scrimmage, and then they throw the ball five straight times, four incompletions, settle for a field goal, 27-21. How the rest of the game could have played out could have been very different had they scored six on that possession. They did the same thing earlier in the game when they got down to the four. They kind of messed that up with a shovel pass, yeah. which made no sense. Was weird... When you're winning at the line of scrimmage, just keep doing it. Yeah. You know, Paul Johnson got a lot of criticism, but I remember being in one of his press conferences one time when he was at Georgia Tech. He's like, look, if we're running left and they can't stop us running left, why would I stop running left? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. You know, exactly. Like Sometimes offensive coordinators want to show you, hey, I got lots of bells and whistles in this playbook. If you only need four plays to win, run the damn four plays over works, and over yeah. and over and win. And I'm not saying that's what Phil Longo was trying to do, but I do think that that is a thing that Mac will, will have learned and, and have to address as well. And the other is the elephant in the room. Well, special teams, before I get defense, special teams. Special teams got worse. They've lost two games the last two years, one each season, because of block punts. In the end, all that played out, after what happened 83 seconds into the game, the block punt that directly led to a touchdown, that cost them the game. That was the play. Last year at Florida State, that cost them the game. Yep. They came back and were in position to win late, didn't get it done, just like in Raleigh, because the, the points that they gave away, um, botch punt protection, cost them the game. Mm. They had a lot of big returns. I went back and traced the other night. I stayed up till 6 o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning, riding the sidebar, doing the research. I went back and looked at all the returns, going back to the Duke game. When things started, that was the game when Jonathan Kim made his first tackle on a kickoff. And we talked about it, Jacob. Yep. When the kicker has to make a tackle, that's a bad sign. Yeah, not great. You had to do it. Had to do it again the next week against Florida State. Hmm. Bad sign. 
real bad sign when it happens two straight weeks. You go back to the Duke game, they allowed either a 22 or like a 30-yard kickoff, 22-point return, 30-yard type kickoff return or more, at least one or the other. And every game sits except Wake and Wofford. Wofford, you toss to the side. And even in the Wake game, they had that curious squib kick. Mm-hmm. When they had to kick off from their 20 late in the yeah, game, that which was I, I didn't, I, I did not understand the logic behind that. So they've had a lot of breakdowns of special teams. They didn't make game changing plays on special teams. And I think that that's something that Mac will is evaluating, has evaluated very, uh, very strongly. And remember, he already got rid of the special teams coach from his first year. So, and I'm not advocating for assistant coach uh, departures. I don't, I don't do that. I'll talk about a head coach. As I've said before, because we don't know everything that goes in to why certain things are done. In the end, a head coach is responsible for everything, and you always know that. So if a head coach is on the hot seat, like when Larry was, I'll say that without a doubt. I won't hesitate. No doubt. But I'm not going to do it with assistant coaches because we don't know everything that's going on behind closed doors. But I would think that one of the things that needs fixing again is the special team. So I'm sure there were some interesting conversations with Javon DeWitt here in the last couple of days. Now to defense, and I know I'm getting long-winded here, but this is a pretty loaded talk about question and loaded response. Uh, the defense was a mess. There's no other way around it. To the, to the defense's credit, it played really well in the second half at Pitt against the best quarterback in the league and against the best offense in the league. Uh, after State's touchdown to make it 14-0, the defense played really well up until those last two possessions against NC State. But you've got to be able to handle those last two possessions. You can't give up a 64-yard touchdown in that situation. When they kick the field goal to go up 30 to 21, you know the conversation is we can't give up a quick score here. We got to make them work for it. If they get a touchdown, got to make them use time, got to make them work for it. They get a sack. Everything was on display in those last two minutes about this defense. They got a sack. And then, boom, 64-yard touchdown. Total breakdown. Blown coverage. Kind of wonder why maybe they were in the call that they were in in that play. Then the onside kick and what happens there, they get a roughing the passer. We saw that a few times this year. They get a PI. We saw that a lot this year. Line up offside. Saw that a lot this year. 24-yard touchdown. So, they gave them 35 yards of penalties. And this defense, we talked about it last week. They never recovered when they had bad penalties on a series. They did not handle in series, in possession adversity well at all. If something bad happened, it's like they would cave Mm -hmm. and the other team would score. You go back to the face mask, the Trey Morrison face mask at Notre Dame is a classic example. Fourth down, the penalties came at a terrible time. What if State has to work for those 35 yards? What if State has to throw the ball, three more pass plays, every time you pass it, Tom O'Brien used to always say, you know, well, I don't like to pass the ball sometimes because three things are going to happen, two of them are bad, incomplete or an interception. Mm-hmm. So you, you're you in – and Carolina has made late plays at times this year. So those penalties took, took away opportunities to make plays that could have changed the game. So uh, in the end, Jacob, the defense was uh, disoriented a lot of the time. Uh, we saw that in the first quarter in Blacksburg, and we saw it on occasion Friday night against NC State. It was no longer an issue of, well, they're still learning. It's still, uh, they're still trying to get a handle of Jay Bateman's schemes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, The the communication was bad. Jay Bateman rejected that earlier in the year, but the communication was bad. You know why? Because Jeremiah Gimble said it was, Mm -hmm. and because Mac Brown said it was. Uh, Did it get better? I think it got a little bit better, but was it good enough? I don't know. They had halves against Virginia, Georgia Tech, which was an abysmal offense, Florida State in the middle two quarters, uh, Miami in the second half with a with a young quarterback who was thrust into action just a couple of weeks earlier. Yep. Both halves against Wake, and the first half against Pitt, where they gave up three hundred or more yards in those two quarter stretches. Oh. So when they were bad, they were really bad. The crazy thing is there were sequences in which the defense was really good. Yeah, there were, and and you could see the athletic ability. And the strengths of those guys, when Jeremiah Gimmel didn't have to worry about everybody and he's making plays, you notice the communication has been a little bit better in the last five games or so. And look who's played better. Look who's been on the ball more. Jeremiah Not a Gimmel. coincidence, yeah. He was allowed to be the player that he is because he didn't have to worry about other things as much. Yeah. But was it enough? It wasn't enough in the first half of Pittsburgh. 
And it wasn't enough out of the gate at Raleigh. And it wasn't enough when they absolutely needed to step up and flex their muscles and get a stop. They did not do that in Raleigh. And I would think the defense, based on how the coaches grade out, Jacob, probably not grade out very high in most areas. A couple of guys I think probably would grade out fairly high, but it's a whole no. And I think ultimately Mac has to decide, you know, is this scheme – uh, is this something that can work at the power five level consistently playing those kind of offenses every week? When you have about 14 seconds of pre-snap communication time, do you really need all that going on or should you simplify? They said they simplified the defense, but that's simplifying that scheme versus having a more simplified scheme in general is the question. A lot of people uh, would like to have answered uh, and we'll see. I don't know. I'm again, I'm not, I'm not going to stump for anybody to lose their job. That's not what, that's not what this is about. This is about what's learned. I think what was learned is that stuff does need to be tweaked at the very minimum. It needs to be tweaked. And uh, both the, the special team scheme, which seemed like there was too much into it when you're just supposed to protect and you're supposed to have your lanes and cut, you know, kick coverage and put coverage and all that kind of stuff. Pretty simple stuff that appeared from the from my vantage point and others in the media whom I spoke to about this. It's like they made things sometimes a little more complicated than were necessary. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we saw the circus like stuff going on at times. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's that was pretty evident. That's something we've talked about a lot this season as well. Just, you know, we could sit here and talk about the defense for another hour probably if we wanted to, but to, for time purposes, we'll move it on to last thing I kind of want to hit on, AJ. I, I want to tie. You talked about in the beginning of the year how you wrote the column about before the season kind of started ahead of Blacksburg about Carolina being a little bit of ahead of schedule. I want to tie this into kind of what the mood is around the fan base right now because you alluded to that earlier as well, talking about how in, in terms of the vibe around the fan base, one of the craziest you've ever seen. And, and I, I get it for in some respects because of the expectations coming into the year. We've kind of dealt with it for a majority of the year. And then it culminates in the way not only a loss to NC State in Raleigh, but the way in which Carolina lost to NC State and Raleigh for me was kind of the icing on top of the, you know, the, the cherry on top of the cake, if you will. I mean, it was, it was kind of last straw for some people based on how it went down. Um, so tying that in, I, I want to talk about that a little bit and kind of what the vibe is around the fan base right now, because I think some of it is warranted. I think some of it also isn't warranted and needs to be calmed down a little bit. And that is going into the thing I want to ask you about. Carolina's not ahead of schedule based on, you know, what we've seen this year. But tying that into it, where do you think Carolina is? If they're not ahead of schedule, are they behind schedule? Or are they maybe right where they should be? Where do you think the program is as a whole? Before I answer that, let's dive into the fan thing real quickly. Uh, I have never seen this fan base so pissed off. I don't think I have either, to be honest. I've, I mean, seen, I know I I've, I've seen them apathetic. I've seen them extremely disappointed. I've seen them think, well, this is our lot in life. But the yep. difference here is, and this is what somebody told me, these aren't my words, I'm relaying them because I think it helps It helps us. And by the way, one of the things I love about this current job is I'm more regularly in interaction with fans than I was when I was at a newspaper or at Fox or something like that. It's a lot easier to get into a bubble or an echo chamber when you're in those types of yep. jobs. But we interact with the people who emotionally are attached to what goes on. I mean, that's they, important, yeah. They, there was somebody on our site that said that they woke up Saturday morning and they were depressed. And, you know, say whatever you want about that, but, but we're dealing with that. So when we write our stuff, you know, we're covering things and we're writing to a fan base, a group of people, especially the subscribers, who are so passionate they pay money to get more information about this program that they love, the school that they love so much, basketball and football and recruiting. So it means a lot to them. Yeah. It's a part of who they are. It's a part yeah, of their lives. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think that Mac Brown would be the first person to tell you it's one of the things he loves about college sports. And he knows it. He was at Texas. Oh, yeah. He understands it. I think that's one of the things that makes college sports so special is that emotional attachment. And pro sports has it too. I'm emotionally attached to the Orioles. Which yeah. is why I'm I, got my, I got my teams as well. Six, yeah. So I'm a miserable such and such for six months a year, every year of baseball season. But but, I, but it's not the same kind of ownership that you have with college sports. So here's a football program that has routinely, when it's gotten close to bumping its head on the ceiling, the legs get cut out and it falls yeah. flat on its derriere and it takes a while to get back up. That's the story of North Carolina football. When Matt came back the first year, 
Seven and six, they close strong. They route Temple in the bowl game. They've got this ballyhooed freshman quarterback who could be a Heisman guy sometimes. They've got skill. They're like, wow, look what they did with Larry's guys that went that won five games in two years. Imagine what they're going to do when they get their own recruits in there. So there was a ton of optimism. And then they have COVID. And I think that they were prepared to handle COVID better than some other programs because they had so many older guys in the program. Yeah. They had so many experienced guys coming back. So they were able to plug and play in some respects last year. And last year was just a weird year for college football. They took advantage. You know, they didn't have to go to Central Florida to open. They didn't have to play Auburn in Atlanta, which could have been losses. They, in, they instead played a more ACC-centric schedule, and they were able to handle it. And they got to the Orange Bowl. Very good team. But a COVID year, I think it was difficult for Mac to get a full gauge on things because it was the COVID year. There were so many restrictions. Now here in year three, all the value, man, all the hype, the sugar and honey, as Mac kept saying. And he wasn't saying we're sugar and honey. He was talking about the sugar and honey being poured on the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they didn't come close to living up to expectations. And I think a lot of the fan base, I had one fan tell me, he was a DM, he must have sent like at two o'clock in the morning. I wondered if he had, you know, been popping a few when he said it. But, <laughs> but, but he said it's uh I feel like I was sold oceanfront property in Nebraska. Yeah, that's a hell of a that's a hell of a lot. Right? And think about that. And, and again, I'm trying to understand, you know, exactly. What, and I have people in my family who are passionate about Carol. I talked to one of them yesterday for 45 minutes and he yelled for 38 minutes about football and even said, This is 48 hours later and I'm still pissed. I've had some of those conversations that, over the, this year as well with some friends and family. But I think I think it it reached a crescendo here in the last few days because of what happened and who it happened against and the stage that it was on and all that stuff. And I think it's just, you know what? A lot of people are like, it's just not working with you guys. Wholesale changes need to be made. People are down on Mac. I never thought I would see that. I figured if it didn't work to people's satisfaction, there wouldn't be animosity geared toward Mac. And there is right now. And a lot of them say that with sort of a but, dot, dot, dot. But if he gets rid of this guy and if he gets rid of that guy and if he makes a change there, we'll we'll, we'll push back and we'll be okay to give you another, to give your four a shot. Yeah. If he does somewhere like if he doesn't make these changes, he's got to go. Yeah. I've never seen this from the Carolina football fan base before. No. I've seen anger about basketball. And what did I tell you a few months ago? Yep. You know, when you when football really starts to matter somewhere, when people really hurt yeah, and get case. pissed, mm-hmm. when they feel let down when you lose, that means that you've actually done something right. So you built it up. To make it matter, make people care. Carolina fans that for years had wanted to win, but didn't invest a lot because they didn't want to be hurt in the end. It's sort of like the person who's gun shy about relationships. You've been screwed over a couple of times. Yeah, you're hesitant. You're hesitant. You want to have a relationship. You want to be in love. You want to have a family, but you're you don't hesitant. Want to get hurt. Yeah. You, don't, exactly. you don't want to get hurt again. So I think Carolina football fans were kind of going down that path and had been for years, including someone I'd known for half a century. That's the way they operated. But this was different. They fell in love. They accepted the date. They put a ring on the finger and boom, they feel like something here happened and they feel incredibly let down. I think in a weird kind of way, it's one of the beautiful things about sports. I do too. I think it's cool when it matters to people. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay with that, especially with the way the world's been the last couple of years. If you can take a detour into the world of college football and care a lot and have that matter to you and have that be your focus at times, then I'm all for it. Yeah. But they want, they want to see something change. They want to see differences. They want to see Mac step up and be the guy he was when he made significant moves at Carolina the first time through and at Texas. And they want to see that. They want to see that fire. They don't want to just see, the CEO, and that's not my term, that's other people's term. They want to see a guy that's saying, okay, we got to change this. This doesn't work. It must change now. Mm-hmm. That's the mood of the fan base. I think it's fascinating because I've, and the basketball fan base is pretty mad too. A lot of these people are the same people. Yeah. They're wondering what the hell's going on it's with basketball right time, now. Yeah. 
it's an interesting time and we're, we're moving, the network's moving a promo right now. And we're trying to sell a promo when the fan base is furious, pretty fascinating times and pretty challenging times, but it is what it is. So as far as whether the program's ahead or behind or right on schedule, I think it's easy to look at what happened in the last three months and say, man, they're way behind because it clouds everything else that's going on. I still think the program's in really good shape. I think Max, message is phenomenal to these kids and they're buying it. They're not going to lose a bunch of kids. Like people said was going to happen. They're going to bring in a great class. And some of these kids are going to become big time players at North Carolina. And a few may help out next year. Yeah. Would not surprise me if George Petaway is on the field next year. Would yeah. not surprise me if a guy like Sebastian Cheeks gets on the field next year. I'm just throwing some names out. They have a lot of guys. Zach Rice. I don't Zach Rice, Travis really Stone. hard for a true yeah. friend, really hard for a true freshman to get on the field. Uh, as an offensive lineman or even a defensive lineman. Travis Shaw, I'm sure he'll play some. Miles mm-hmm. Murphy played last year as a, as a true freshman some. But they're certainly foundational, and they're following two other really good classes. So the program's in really good shape. They're bringing in young talent. Uh, they've got a tremendous message. They're fixing the infrastructure of the program, which needed a lot. Uh, hint, hint, they need a new press box, and they need luxury suites. A different topic for a different day. Uh, but I think a lot of things are going in the right direction. And I think the value, going back to what I said a little while ago, Jacob, the value, the benefit that Mac has in what he learned the last few months. There are some things that you know, he was out of the game for five years. He was yeah. broadcasting, but he wasn't coaching. And it changed a lot. He's talked about that. So he comes back into coaching, and I credit him at the age of 67 when he came back in that he didn't try to win the 2003 Texas way or the 1995 North Carolina way, or when he took Tulane to a bowl game, which by the way, is one of the great accomplishments of his career, especially back when there were 18 bowl games. Okay. He didn't try to win that way. He brought in an offensive scheme. He had never had before. He brought in this new interesting defensive scheme that worked great for army. Well, if it works for Army, imagine what it can, how it can do with a bunch of North Carolina athletes, P5 athletes. He gave these things a chance. And even with the special teams with Javon DeWitt and some of the, the interesting approach to that. So credit him for that. But in the process, he sat back and learned a lot. He's a very thoughtful guy. He's an observer. He's not always going to be the coach that's yelling and fanny slapping and raw rawing and stuff. He's just soaking it in. Mm-hmm. Uh, very cerebral. Not every coach is very cerebral. He is. So I would think that because of what he's learned, they'll they'll hit the ground in August next year for camp in better shape than things appear right now because of that. And guess what? All that other stuff's still going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say that they're not behind. On the field, they were certainly not ahead. I would say they're probably where they need to be and where Mac was hoping to be by year three, with the exception of some of the breakdowns on the field, special teams defensively, especially like I said, average, average defense is club is 10 and two, nine and three. If they're 10 and two, nine and three, they get a few more stops. They have a few, a couple fewer penalties. We're not having this conversation because a lot of other stuff still headed in the right direction. So uh, in a very long way to answer your question, Jacob, I would say they're probably where they need to be. But we'll know how far ahead they could jump next year, given what Mac has learned this year and whatever changes are made, whether they're uh, drastic changes or whether they're minor tweaks. Yeah. We'll find out here in the next month or so. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Maybe to see. sooner. It'll be interesting to see. And I've even seen some people kind of throwing out the Dabo Sweeney comparison in terms of his first few years. I know he came in kind of later in the season, but his first few years at Clemson, he had two pretty good years. And then his third year, they kind of, I think they finished six and seven, lost in the Monarchy car Carable, and then never looked back after that, you know, double digit wins for the next, let's see, uh, four, you know, really you have, they've won double digit games since then, since that 2010 yeah. season. So they haven't looked back since then. You could see a, we've seen it happen. You've seen programs take a step in the right direction, nine and five at Clemson in 09, then six and seven in 2010. And like I've said, they've won 10 plus games in the last, you know, because you learn yeah. because Dabo learned and recruited Dabo and learned you build as well. And you find out, okay, well, this doesn't work. So I got I to shave this off. We're mm-hmm. not doing this anymore. We're not doing this scheme. We're not doing all this communication. We're not – we're going we're gonna to start playing starters and special teams more instead of a bunch of freshmen. Yeah. You know, for, all the, for all the criticism of Larry Fedora, Larry Fedora's special teams are outstanding. Phenomenal, yeah. He played starters. 
Matt Collins got to the NFL because of his ability to play special teams and no catch the deep it. ball. But mm. without the special teams, Mac wouldn't have gotten a sniff with the NFL, and he's still in the league. Yep. Good luck. So, team. yeah. So may, maybe there are changes made there. Maybe you, you, all that great depth you're accumulating, maybe you give a linebacker five extra snaps in a game because you want your starter on special on a certain special teams. It's not bad. To bolster special teams. There are, I, there are things that are going to be learned. There are tweaks that are going to be made at the very minimum. And, and I agree that I think sometimes the year three is like that, especially when year one is just, let's get things going. Let's just feel good. Mm-hmm. All right. Then year two is COVID. Yeah. COVID. I mean, who could take, yeah. Look at, you know, look at Indiana. Indiana had a great year last year during COVID. People said, well, Tom, 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 uh, uh, John Blake, uh, Tom Allen has got a great thing going on there with Indiana. They were preseason ranked. Well, they, they went winless in the big 10. Yeah. yeah. He just fired a couple of assistants and took a pay cut to apply toward hiring new assistants. Yep. That's not going on in Chapel Hill. Yep. This, it, you know, COVID was a weird year. I don't think a lot was learned during COVID in the end. And I think that when we get further away from the 2020 season for both football and basketball, 2020, 2021 basketball, and, and coaches are honest and open about stuff, we're going to find out that they learned very little. They were just piecing together something and trying to get to the finish line. Definitely. And when you do that, you're not really growing. No. So they may not have really grown much last year. And Max even said, look, some of those guys kind of camouflaged that we weren't really where we needed to be, no, but I'm they not. helped make it look like we were further ahead. Mm-hmm. And they were all Larry guys, by the way. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to see. It'd be fascinating off season kind of going into next year. No, that's yeah. why he's kind of still got a bowl game as well. We'll obviously have that announced whenever we figure out what that's going to be. Still some time. That'd be that. Sunday. Like, It'll be when I'm in the press room at Georgia Tech Sunday. That course, of course, right? Yeah. Couldn't couldn't be any other way. Yeah, I couldn't not have like a day. You know, no. all I do is I root for no conflict with basketball. But Dina King, I think, is secretly, cruelly rooting for the Tar Heels to play in the bowl game in Fenway Park. So I have to go up there and be around Red Sox lore. <laughs> hey, just make sure you wear that Orioles hat behind you if it if it is. My, or, no, I'll wear my Orioles mask. I love that. That's what you need right there. That'll be that'll. If be we great. have to wear a mask, I guess <laughs> yeah. with that with that new thing coming, we'll all be wearing oh, yeah, iron sure. suits before long. Yeah, we'll be back in that very very soon. I'm sure as well. So yeah, it's 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 an interesting year. Don't go cover. there. Don't go there. <laughs> Fascinating year to cover. Um, you know, from just from a whole different whole lot of perspectives, which we hit on in here. And like I said, we could probably spend another hour talking about Carolina football and everything. But for time purposes, I think it's a good good place to wrap this one up and. Like I said, it's still a bowl game to be played. We'll see how that goes. I guess we'll have more information on that. should be announced on Sunday, and then we'll obviously have some coverage leading up to that as well, and, of course, during it and after. But as always, guys, make sure you keep it locked to TarHillIllustrated.com. Great time to sign up as well. Link to the website in our description is below. Maybe we get a, a whole year of a membership for just $20.21, less than a candy bar a month. So take advantage of that. Great time to do it with all the stuff going on right now with football, basketball, and recruiting. Busy time of the year. AJ can attest to that for sure. Um, but <laughs> no, it seems like the days yes. – uh, I think it's just like one big day, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, it gets dark every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, it's about it. But I don't, I don't think the day ever resets. But, AJ, we'll wrap this one up, man. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. As always, guys, make sure you like, share, subscribe. Hit that notification bell as well so you know every single time we upload. And we do upload a ton this time of year. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.